Hi ladies and gentlemen this is Maushi Jaz you're watching me on my YouTube channel you're listening to me on Spotify there are people in the world who go through experiences on their own and then through those experiences they try to make the world better for other people because they know what it's like to go through said experiences i'm with an autism mom today who's gone through all the Uh, ups and downs in the roller coaster life that is being an autism mom uh she's also somebody who's doing a wonderful initiative uh, which is establishing a care system for neurodivergent people and also domiciliary care in the UAE uh i found her on facebook of all places uh, let me welcome uh, to the studios and to my podcast uh, sumaya raja assalam alaikum sumaya Wa-alaikum how are you assalam thank you very much for having me <laughs> Very Thank you so much for giving me your time, mm-hmm. Sumaya. Mm-hmm. I know you're in and out of the UAE. Yeah, absolutely. And from the UK, and uh, we've met a couple of times. We've mm-hmm. talked about your experiences here. So I thought it would be, and you know, you have such an interesting profile. So I thought it would be very interesting to share. your story with the people that i usually talk yeah, to thank uh, you <laughs> so so my yes start off about what it's like to be an autism mom uh and i and i believe your children are grown up now they are they are they're grown now i mean they don't like me calling them babies anymore oh. but they will always be my babies <laughs> but the youngest is 16 and then i've got an 18 year old daughter and then a 20 year old son mm-hmm. and the, both my sons are neurodivergent so they have diagnosis of autism mm. um and you know i it goes through peaks and flows we have good days and bad days but at the on the whole at the moment it's very good mm. you know we've gone through that sticky um schooling age mm. um but challenges keep coming mm. you know but i think it's i i it is different to parenting a child that doesn't have the neurodiversity but i don't know that it's harder <laughs> but it's just very different mm-hmm. so we have to adjust our mindset to accommodate for them mm. certainly Uh, when you obviously your children are grown and the reason why i pointed that out was mm. because uh, a while ago and we're still in the process of learning mm. more about neurodivergence a while ago or, or let's say maybe 10 years ago even in the uae or in pakistan where i'm from uh, neurodivergence was still a very faint term people didn't know mm. about it now that you know you're in the uae and you're also dealing with the asian community on a large scale because your family part of your family is asian right yes so when you now look at how people's attitudes have changed and what has been your journey like in trying to hopefully educate mm. people about neurodiversity i mean it's been a phenomenal jump really mm. the attitude has just shifted hugely i mean here in the uae where they use the term people of determination that's wonderful at home still we um using disabled mm. um or you know less abled or special educational needs and i think there needs to be a change with that certainly um but here in the uae people's attitudes are leaps and bounds ahead of at home mm. um i remember when my son was diagnosed and it was around 16 years ago and i knew nothing about autism um even when it was suggested to me that possibly we're looking at a diagnosis of autism i I couldn't even draw on any experience. I'd never heard of it, really, mm. if I'm honest. I'd never ever heard of it. Um and I think you know, people's attitudes it wasn't that they were backwards in any way. It was more a lack of knowledge. Mm. And I think as as the community's gained knowledge, it's certainly become more acceptable and they're more willing to accommodate it. Um but I mean back then my my attitude was probably quite similar there was little to no understanding mm. at all mm. um and then obviously we embarked on this huge journey mm. of learning everything there was that we could possibly learn about mm. autism mm. and you know 16 years ago we didn't have the phones that we have now yeah. and um the Google. internet yeah wikipedia <laughs> my god um, i mean i remember searching on facebook for like a group or something and i think maybe i found a group of about 7 adults adult parents that um were talking about autism seven adult yeah. parents <laughs> that's nothing. it <laughs> and now when you go on to groups you're looking at sort of 7000 locally yeah, yeah. yeah um so it's it's a massive change mm. so there's not just the support in in groups in the community there's support online mm. um and i do think we're moving in the right direction but there's still so much work to be done what kind of work do you think communities and governments and setups need to do and um because what i've noticed is that we first of all obviously it all begins begins from understanding mm. the term so before we move on to that let's talk about what it is to be neurodivergent you're parenting neurodivergent children yeah. uh how do you feel like and what would you say to the people who maybe don't understand the term that well 
Yeah, I mean, it's quite a tricky one, really, isn't it? Because every neurodivergent is person is so different. So different. Yeah. So you've got your area, the the triad of impairments, and mm. you need to have. Um, not deficiencies, but you need to have something in each of those corners of the triad um, to, to warrant the diagnosis. And I mean, I've got two sons that are neurodivergent and they're both so different. So one is quite academic, but socially he's very black and white. His mm. voice is very monotone. And even when he's showing excitement, he'll tell you that he's happy and he's excited, but you don't get that from looking at him. So he's quite hard to read. Um, but I mean aren't all men so I'm starting to be okay with this um you know and my other son um he's less academically focused but he's like a comedy you know he's, he's a comedy sketch mm. and he's really funny and charismatic and he loves people mm. um and he likes talking to them and entertaining them mm. you know which is totally opposite to the other one so mm. it's really hard to find a um you know, it's really hard to give someone an overview mm. of what it is. And mm. I think it's just about accepting that people are different. Mm. Um, and this, I mean, it takes time. With my youngest son, because he is so monotone a lot of the time, he likes quiet. He likes his head to be quiet. Um, he doesn't like excessive noise and really chaotic environments. The other one is completely opposite. <laughs> um, and quite often, the younger one, whose name is Issa, he'll take himself off into his bedroom. And as a mum, you know, we're sitting there thinking, oh, is he OK? Should I be thinking about mental health? Is he alone? What's he doing? Mm. You know, but for him, that's his time out. And I think even for me, it was a big adjustment to realise that just because he's not with me and doing what is normally considered acceptable socially or acceptable family activities, that doesn't mean that he's not OK, that he's taking what he needs. Um and it's a constant adjustment, mm. really is a constant mm. adjustment because we have our own preconceived ideas. Mm. About what autism is. Yeah, about what yeah. it is, what it looks like. Um, and even when we see what it looks like in an individual, we're trying to sort of plug the gaps and, and make it okay And pigeonhole them, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Maya, when, uh, when you were going through this adolescent period and then mm. now you are here in the UAE and you've set up something so wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, would you say that the experiences you went through are why you're setting up something like this? And when you talk to other parents who are parents of neurodivergent children uh, in the UAE and the UK in general, mm. wherever, um, what are the needs that you feel that they have which you think that your service could... And tell us about your service yeah. as well. Yeah, so... Well, it, it is born out of frustration on mm. my part um, because I found that there were many services available for the school age. Mm. So sort of two to seven, you're sorted. You've mm. got things like ABA, speech and language, OT. You know, there's many wonderful and children programs. children are still more pliable in that they age, are. so it's easier to handle them also, they right? They are, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and at school then, after the, after sort of... After sort of the age of seven, they've then got their TAs that maybe go in and support them at accessing the activities that the other children are doing. So it's it's almost, even if they're not fully integrated, they are parallel. Adjustable. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're sort of functioning parallel alongside whatever's going on. And then we hit teenage years. And honestly, that is a catastrophe. <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, I've got experience with obviously children that aren't neurodiverse and neurodiverse children. And um it certainly adds another layer to the cake. <laughs> um, it's it's hard enough anyway, but teenage years are very tricky because mm. you've got children that want to go out alone. They want a bit more independence. Um, and you've and in my case anyway, you ha we had quite naive children that had been heavily supported mm. with TAs and adult helpers, and mm. a lot of the time women adult helpers. Um, just it just generally in the U in the UK, sorry it. The TAs generally are women. Mm. Um, so they were very comfortable mm. in that environment. But as they turned into teenagers and they wanted to do more teenage sort of boy things and certainly there needed to be a level of independence, we mm. just weren't there. Mm. Um, and I remember sort of brainstorming with our ABA consultant at the time and we were saying, you know, what can we do? And we, we sort of come up with this buddy system. And I remember I hired this young guy whose name was Matt, who was phenomenal. Mm. And he had no experience with autism other than his sister was an ABA therapist. Um, but he was a really cool young guy. He was at uni, I think. And he was into rugby and Marvel, comics, mm. um, you know, exactly what my boys were into. And I hired him and he would come over on a Saturday and take them out to like the comic store and buy these... Um, DC and Marvel comics 
that were from America and all these wonderful places that I knew nothing about. So, um, and he'd spend time with them and do things that normal kids would do. Um, and I say normal because uh, although my children were normal, but they didn't have the run of the mill experience that 90% of the class had. Um, but he, he allowed them to access that. So he acted like a body system. And because he was a young guy, it didn't look as odd as, you know, mum coming with you to a football club or, or supporting you buying tickets at the cinema or whatever it might be. Um, so he was like their chaperone almost. Um, but because we chose someone very close, uh, well, as young as possible, um, so it was quite close in age, um, he was able to go with them to places that I wasn't welcome <laughs> because, you know, no one wants their mum with them, do they? Let's mm, be honest. Mm. Um, so that was fantastic for mm. them. And then we sort of thought, you know, this is a thing that ch these children, they need a role model. They need chaperones. So then we, he had some training given to, given to us by our team um, about autism and, um, you know, there were some sensory issues as well. Um, and he was able to support them going into the community, you know, going out for dinner, going out for lunch, going to the shops, getting a cab or learning how to use the train mm. um, or the metro here it would be. But so that was a fantastic initiative that we sort of started at home in the, U in the UK. And um, when I came here, we started Home Care Dubai, which was predominantly nursing and domiciliary care. Um, and then we saw this huge gap, um, you know, there's brilliant services here that I think are second to none in terms Absolutely. of education. Mm. But there's there's this tricky area of the teenage years where it all sort of starts to unravel. And mm. particularly as mums, we're pulling our hair out thinking, what do we do? Mm. Because we now need to transition from a heavily sort of helicopter parent role yes, yes. <laughs> into this, you know, I want you to be as independent as you can be. It mm. doesn't mean that each autistic child will achieve, you know, the same results. But it's really important to us that my boys they needed to reach their full potential of mm. independence mm. um so that's why we started offering this chaperoning and buddy system so our staff are trained in autism and we train in um, sensory sensitivities and we look at the family as a whole and see where they would need support mm. um, whether it's a really busy extended family household that they live in and we go in and just support the child in functioning in that environment because sometimes that is tough itself you know you've got aunties and uncles coming over you need to say salam to everyone you need to sit and eat dinner with everyone and you also need to not have a meltdown and then take yourself off at the right time to sort of calm down um, so it could be that somebody comes in and just prompts the prompts the young person to be able to do those things mm. um, or it could be that you've got someone quite active that wants to access, you know, sports clubs in the community. Mm. Um, but they can't just jump in the car with the driver or the mum. You know, yeah, they need it's someone not that there. simple. Yeah, mm. they need someone there to just prompt. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the chaperones can do that as well, mm. which is, I think people are starting to understand the service a little bit more. At first, they didn't. Mm. You know, they uh, it's very much an understanding that, well, I've got a maid, a full-time maid, so she could do it, or I've got a driver and he could do it. But I think they're starting to see that actually having someone there to support. And who's trained. Yeah. And preempt, you know, the staff are very good at understanding once they know the child, understanding what the triggers are. So if it's loud noises or if it's um, animals or chaotic environments, they can sort of preempt that and almost schedule in the time before that happens to pull them out, um, you know, get it all back together, quiet their mind down and get it back together so they can go back into the environment and access whatever it is that they want to do. Um, so it is very different to having a maid. Mm. Um, but I think this is going to come with education here in, mm. in the UAE because it's not just that we need a pair of eyes on that child. We're trying to support them to become the very best version of them. Mm. Um, we're not just a babysitting service. Mm. We're a whole lot more than that. So. Yeah, yeah. And it's so interesting you mentioned that uh, education is so important. Uh, mm. I feel like uh, when the UAE started off, and it's a very young city uh, yeah. country in the sense that uh, in terms of U Dubai's development, mm -hmm. it's still very recent. Yeah. It's not something like, you know, the services in the UK have been around for a while. The, mm -hmm. the NHS and all of those systems have been developed for a bit. So I think that uh, 10 years ago, probably the same services that are available in the UAE today uh, yeah. were not there. And now they've kind of developed at a breakneck speed, mm. which is insane. It's amazing. And I wish that other countries would also take note that, look, if you really want to do something, this is the way to go. This yeah. is the speed at which you should develop. Now I feel like in the UAE for neurodivergent teenagers, uh, 
again like you said they're slowly beginning to understand mm. parents that okay yes we need this with we need a specialized setup for children yeah. uh teenagers uh when you're now talking to people uh, do you notice how what uh, what are the reactions and like now with your service being fully available mm. in the UAE and now when parents reach out to you uh what are what is what is your takeaway now how long has the system been running in the UAE now and mm. uh, what do you see in the future i mean they seem they do seem still that it is going to take some time mm-hmm. to understand mm-hmm. because there is this attitude that we've got staff so mm. why would we need this extra mm. member of or staff or the kids go to school yeah. why do we need that yeah absolutely so but i think um i think the attitude is definitely changing okay um I mean, it has come on leaps and bounds mm. here. And it has, absolutely, yes. There's nothing compared to it, I mm. don't think. I've not seen, uh, certainly at home, although we've got systems in place and services yes. available, it's not comparable to what's available here. Mm. I mean, the schools, all of them now have inclusion officers, don't mm. they, here in the mm. UAE, yes. which is which is very, you know, amazing to see mm. um, that that's a prerequisite for any school. And even in Dubai airport, they give you a lanyard for hidden yeah. disabilities, which is absolutely brilliant. I went through the airport the other day and... Honestly, it was so warming to see there was somebody standing there as a big banner, and they had the lanyards, and they said, "Come and talk to us about what we're what we're talk, what we're doing, our initiative." I just thought, "Wow, like this is a country that's really pushing itself to make people understand." Yes, absolutely, um, and it can be a bit of a boiling pot here sometimes because you've got people from all over the world, which mm-hmm. is part of what makes the fabric of Dubai so brilliant. Mm. Um, but also, it's hard when you're trying to change. Um, ideas that are deep embedded um, because you've got so many different ideas cultures and understanding. And melting, <laughs> it's a melting pot of so many cultures. It yeah. is. And I think they're doing a really good job at promoting, yeah. you know, this people of determination and the allowances that need to be made, but not just allowances, just the, it's the understanding from us, mm. um, the, you know, the non-neurodivergent community. Yes. It, that is the change that needs to happen. Mm. The, everything's here available for mm. those that need it. Um, but I think it's, our shift in mentality and understanding that now needs to happen. Mm. Um, And people seem to be on board with that. They really do. Okay. So do you feel in the future, do you, how do you want to, or ideally, how Mm. would you want your setup to grow? Because I know that right now you're trying to establish a buddy system. You have one-to-one care. You're also offering care for elderly um, family members at home. Um, Explain about that as well. And then also how you want to take, this kind of thing forward eventually uh, if you had a larger goal what would that be yeah so I mean in terms of the home nursing that we offer um, that's something that we do in the UK mm. um, as a family my, it's my family business we've done that for a very long time um, and when we looked at doing it here the health services here are, you know gold star standard aren't they Absolutely. You know? five star <laughs> yeah, yeah they really like, are I, insane. I mean yeah. it's the you know <laughs> the only country in the world that's got a seven star hotel and the services here available they kind of match that don't yeah. they yeah so what we wanted to do is bring home care dubai here and offer sort of a british standard of customer service in with the nursing so it's not just a tick sheet that the staff come through and um you know the nurses don't come through and just offer a tick sheet they're looking at a holistic approach they're looking at how to lift your mood how to you know in incorporate family family it's not just about giving the medication absolutely not no um so we look at you know the whole person Mm. um and that was really exciting for us to bring that here because although there are some other companies that do something similar um we were really excited about getting down and meeting meeting people on the ground and seeing what their wants were and where the gaps were and what we could what we could do to Mm. you know bridge those and our staff are still we train although they're employed where they've already got their qualifications, so they've already got their nursing uh, degree and things. We run a lot of online courses with them that are from the UK, so the CPD courses Mm. in autism, dementia, um, you know, food prep, manual handling. Um, So the staff are really trained in how to care for that person. It's a very tailored plan. Mm. And if there was something that we felt wasn't covered in their cv or in their knowledge bank that's certainly something that we would train with so we really try to offer you know a customer service element to care Mm. um, rather than just a very clinical response Mm. so i mean that's in terms of the nursing Um, and we hope that that what we're hoping is that once we've got a bigger team that it doesn't matter if you get 
Sylvie or or you know Jane, they're all going to offer that same level of hmm. level of service and care, and you know what you'll expect when when one of our team members walks through the door. Hmm. Um, so that's what we're where we're hoping to take that. Hmm. Um, in terms of the autism care. We'd really like to partner with some schools um, mm. and see if we can offer some summer support to parents because I think that being a parent myself, what would happen is we'd have a fantastic acquisition rate through the school year and we'd be learning all these new skills and then it would come to, you know, these huge long holidays and yeah. I'd be pulling my hair out. They'd mm. be looking at me bored thinking, you know, she's <laughs> she doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> And we'd start losing skills that mm. they'd worked so hard to gain. Mm. Um, and what we try to do is we try to bridge that gap. So we look at what the, what they've been doing at school, try to generalise those skills into a different environment because we know typically autistic children, you know, I mean, I had one myself that would read at school and at home it was like he'd never seen a book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we had to generalise that skill. It didn't just naturally transfer. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, so we're looking at supporting parents outside of the education setting and bridging that gap. So mm. whether it's generalising skills or teaching new life skills, learning how to cook a simple dish, um, that's what we would like to do. And in the future, I'm hoping to see partnerships with schools so mm. that we could we could be working alongside them. Mm. Um, at the moment, I think as because it's a new service, some schools think that maybe we're offering education, but we certainly don't. We offer mm. the care component, mm. um, but we are not educators. It's an extra support layer, <laughs> yeah, right? It's not, it is. It's not a school, no, not no. at all. <laughs> no, not at all. We definitely don't want that task of teaching. <laughs> <laughs> but Samaya, when, uh, when uh, a parent who's, uh, you know, trying to make things better for the community, and you know it's coming from a place of love mm. and frustration, yes, yeah. uh, do you get tired? Do you are there are there points in your journey? And I'm not just talking about the UAE. I'm mm. talking about the UK. I'm talking about as a parent. Do you get tired or frustrated? And do you do you come to a point where like, oh, this is just. I mean, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Why did I decide to pick up this? You know, giant mission. Yeah. Do you I, feel like that? I do. I do sometimes. And I remember. I remember the earlier days, and it was so much harder. Mm. I mean. When my boys started going into mainstream school, we didn't have the TA support. Mm. I mean, this is many years ago. So yeah. it, show, it shows my age now. And you're now. talking about the UK when <laughs> yeah. you went to the school in the UK. In the UK, yeah. yeah. So this is showing my age. But we didn't have um, the TAs available. And so the school knew that they needed a TA. We couldn't find the right person. So then... I managed to convince them that to let me into school mm. to support my child, mm. which is not, you know, it's not ideal, but we didn't have an option. It was either he went to school with me or didn't go at all because they oh. had no staff. Mm. Um, and I remember going in and supporting him and I'd done all the training and everything, but it's so hard, especially because you're trying to put mum feelings to one side in one box and then, you know, educator feelings in another box and you're sort of sifting through it all and what must people think and you know all of this stuff and I remember going into school and it was a really hard day and one of my children was there um and he hated PE because he hated the echoes that the oh the yeah. gym made yeah yeah he hated it um mm. and I remember him him thumping the teacher mm. <laughs> and and he said to her are you going to send me out now mm. and I thought oh my gosh this child has got out of this lesson by sort of being disruptive yes over and over Smart. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so you know anyway on that day I remember going home and I went in the bathroom as a lot of mums do mm. and I'm sure that there are many that will sympathize with this we go to school a parents evening and then we go home and lock ourselves in the bathroom for a minute and have that moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't want anyone to see it mm. it's like when you go to a birthday party and it's just been an overwhelming stimulation mm. and you get in the car they're screaming you're screaming and I think even for neurotypical parents yeah. and children birthday parties can be quite stressful it can yeah. it really can mm. um, and I've had many times when you know you've had those moments that I just need five minutes alone so whether it's in the bathroom or in the car and I think other mums all mums not just ones of autism but all mums will sympathise with that point so there is that element um but now, as they're older and I look back at, at the journey and I remember those hard times, I just feel grateful. Mm. I just feel grateful that we got through it. <laughs> in one uh, piece. Yeah, we're, we're in one piece. We're relatively normal, you know, functioning people, <laughs> I like to think. Um, but yeah, so I do, I still am tired and I'm exhausted with it sometimes. And sometimes it's a lot, particularly work-wise. Um, but because I'm so passionate about it and mm. I know where 
I know those dark times in the early years and how I felt and the journey that we've come on to get where we are today. And I'm so passionate about offering, a, even if it's just a piece of that, to some of the families. Mm. Um, so I think that's what keeps me going with it and upbeat about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not all doom and gloom, but sometimes autism is tough. It can yeah. be tough. It's mm. tough for the people with it and it's tough for people supporting it because yes. we don't understand it. Mm. And it's like we're speaking a different language quite often. Um, and I think you wouldn't be human if you didn't sort of feel that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, when you talk about educating people about autism or mm. under helping people understand what experiences for an autism mom is like... Um, how do you feel that can improve? And I'm and I wish that you would speak in a way that could speak to people again who mm. haven't experienced what yeah. you have experienced or other autism parents have experienced. Uh, because I feel like sometimes when we are on the outside yeah. and we're looking into somebody mm. else's life, we don't really know. And that's normal. No. We yeah. don't really understand what somebody else mm. is going through. It's only that person who's knowing that. Um, but what would you say that I wish people knew that and I wish yeah. this is what they would do um, to maybe be more supportive, maybe be more empathetic. Uh, what what goes through your head? Like, let's say if you're going through an experience like that and you're frustrated and the first thought that comes to your head is that I wish that they would understand that this is what the experience is like. Mm. I mean, I can think of a time when I was out in public and we were in the supermarket and it would all become too much. Mm. And my child was having a huge meltdown, sort of crying, screaming beside himself, couldn't control it and couldn't calm down. And obviously you've got a basket of food. You, what can you do? You've mm. got to continue. You've got to finish it off. You can't just walk out. Although I wanted to, I wanted to just scoop him up in my arms and go in the car and, and cry with him. Mm. Um, but, but I couldn't. And then you've got people looking, oh. What's she doing? Why is she? Why is her child crying? Why is she not meeting his need? Why? Why is she? You know, ignoring him. Mm. But I think, obviously, they're not going to understand in that time. Um, and the behaviour did need ignoring because he had everything he needed, and you know, we'd put everything in place for him to be successful in that environment. Ear defenders, you know, now and then cards. We'd spoken what. Yeah, but sometimes it's just yeah. still overwhelming. It's still yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. Um, you know, we'd prepped him for we're going to the supermarket. This is what we're doing. And it was part of a program as well that we were working on that when we go out, we've got a list of things that we're going to do and we're going to work through it. And then we return home um, because before that we'd get in, we'd get into the environment and it wouldn't be going well. So we'd abandon whatever we were doing. And this is not real life. This couldn't happen forever. So yeah. we needed to change it. Um, but I remember, you know, these women looking at me and feeling like I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me and I think what I would like people to understand is that you won't necessarily look at someone and know that they're autistic and you might not see the struggle so you would possibly think and I, I'm pretty sure these ladies did think this is just bad parenting mm. um and just have that understanding that no mum wants to see their child cry. Yeah. No mum wants to have that meltdown in the yeah, supermarket. Nobody with everyone wants to interrupt looking. their shopping trip with a no, meltdown. No. 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 Nope. Um, and just have the understanding that, you know, you looking, talking, pointing and staring is not helpful. Mm. You know, um, instead, just smile and it, ignore. It almost ignore that ignore it's happening. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, I think if I was telling people that didn't know anything about autism, it's just don't expect it to look a certain way because mm. it really does not. Mm. Um, and try not to be judgmental. Mm. And even if you don't understand it, you know, park that thought and, yeah. and put it on a group chat later on. Find, a, you know, these WhatsApp groups that us women are such oh, big fans of. Yeah. Yeah. Let it out there, but yeah. don't be staring at a child yeah. and a mum in the supermarket when, you know, when it's clearly going really, really wrong. <laughs> I mean, we're talking car crash situation. Yeah. Um, that's not the time to be airing your concerns or thoughts <laughs> about mm. what's going on. Um, but I just think that if people were a bit softer mm. and kinder, um, we'd it would be a bit easier. Yeah. But I mean, I have had, um, I have seen this happen with another family. I was in the supermarket on my own and I saw this mum and I could see that she was just fraught. You know, this child is not coping and she's doing everything to try and get him through. You know, we're almost there. We're almost at the end. I think she'd done the whole fruit and veg section and the dry goods and we at the freezer section. And in the UK, the freezer section is the end. That's where you're paying. Mm. So <laughs> this mum had done the whole supermarket and you could tell that she was just, you know, at, at her wits end. And I remember thinking, what do you do? Because I want to help her because I can see the child's going 
you know, <laughs> you can see it's going wrong here, um, but it's not a place to intervene. And um, I just caught her eye and we smiled, it changed smiles. And, you, and it's like, it's like that mutual understanding. Um, you sort of meet people sometimes and and there's it, you just sort of touch each other and yeah. I don't really know what it is I can't explain it and put it into yeah. words but anyway we just had this sort of look <laughs> and <laughs> smiled at each other and then I saw her at the checkout and I tapped her on the shoulder and I said you know what I can see that you're struggling you, you're doing a really good job mm. you don't need to hear that from a stranger but it's commendable and I get it mm. and she had tears in her eyes and you could tell that it meant so much to her yeah you know um that actually someone gets me yeah. someone gets that it's not easy yeah and um, someone gets that I'm trying my best yeah, yeah. And sometimes your best is it's, it's, it's still it's, not enough yeah it's still not <laughs> enough but it's your best it's your best um, yeah but yeah so I think people's attitudes could just be a bit kinder yeah and and just the smile goes a long way. You don't I need feel to the do same. anything. Yeah, I feel just the same smile. way about people when they're judgmental about kids crying on a plane. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, it's, <laughs> the parent doesn't want this either. Trust no. me. Nobody wants to have a screaming baby mm. in your lap when you're just trying to eat your food or stuck in a small yeah. chair or, you know, flying thousands of feet up in the air. Yeah. And then uh, I really don't like people who complain about stuff yeah. like that because it's just it's not in anybody's control. really. No. No. And nobody's nobody's a bad parent like no. that. I don't think. I mean, I would f- say that out of like the hundred, let's say if it's a hundred people, maybe one person may just not care. Maybe that's yeah. also a maybe. I think yeah. hundred out of hundred parents will be doing whatever they can. Yeah. Or they've probably just tried everything or have given up. Yeah. Like I can't do anything. <laughs> they've, they've used every single thing that they've yeah. got in their toolkit to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're just going to wait for that storm yeah. to pass Absolutely. over. Absolutely. Speaking of kind and being not judgmental, um, do you feel like, I also feel like sometimes I think that a lot of these things are not taught in schools. Yeah. I, I, I think I talked about it in one of my videos that you know, we're not teaching children to be kind. It's yeah. also, it's not just that parent who's staring at you in the mm. supermarket. It's also, you know, autistic children and there were researches and I'm sure you've gone through yeah. it as well that and autistic parents, autism parents have gone through it. The children face bullying in school yeah. and they, they the, growing up with mm. peers who are neurotypicals, it's not a walk in the yeah. park at all. Um what I feel like we need to like teach this in schools like I not just okay this is neurodiversity and this is what mm. it means the definition and all but like just teaching children to be kind to other children in terms of any kind of differences yeah and uh, w- what would you say to how the education system is built not just again in the UK UAE but like overall how mm. we're teaching children we're teaching children about but formulas and theorems yeah. but where's where are we teaching them empathy is it do you, or do you have to enroll in a liberal arts college yeah. to <laughs> don't learn? Know. Yeah. I mean in the UAE I don't know much about the schooling here in in terms of teaching this kind of stuff I think stuff. in the UAE it's it's more like the community and the the way that people are interact with each other is mm. just in general polite and kind yeah. So I think overall that may translate into schools as well I think so Yeah but and people seem to be very yes. warm here Yeah So um I was talking to my daughter the other day and she's saying at school that they do cultural awareness days to make sure that everyone understands everyone's religion um, and life choices and things. And it's, you know, these are big days that are celebrated. Um, And she said, there's never anything to understand neurodiversity. Mm. Um, And she obviously she's got two brothers that are neurodiverse. She Mm. feels very passionate about Mm. this. Mm. And she went to the teacher and she was asking, you know, can we have a day to understand this? Because there's varying degrees of people with, that have learning needs, whether mm-hmm. it's dyslexia, ADHD, autism, um, many different things. And the the teacher was really sort of taken back that, oh, well, we accommodate for, the, for that. We do. We have, the, you know, the TAs. And she said, no, 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 I don't want you to talk about how to support them. I want to talk about letting us know how to support them as a community. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, I took it for granted that this happens. Um, but hearing it from her and because she is so passionate about it, because she has got two brothers mm, on the spectrum mm. um, and she's got some cousins as well. Um, I thought, wow, you know, this young girl has got a bit, a bit between her teeth mm. and she's now making it a thing in her school to talk mm. about. And she wants to have days to um, give awareness to this types of thing. And I think maybe that is something that could be incorporated into schools Mm. that we have, you know, a difference day, Mm. whatever the difference may be. Yeah. Um, you know, rather than, oh, we have a religious day where we celebrate everyone's religion or everyone's culture, Mm. maybe just, you know, a day celebrating people's differences, whatever they are, Mm. um, 
could be a good thing. Yeah, um, it's a nice idea. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, and then it gives everyone the opportunity to come with their difference, mm. rather than us saying this is the difference we are, and that you're different. Yeah, that person's different. <laughs> this is the difference we're permitted to talk about. It, yeah. it gives the opportunity for everyone to come with their own difference that mm. they um, want everyone to understand and they want to share. Mm. So I think something like this would be a really good idea. Mm. I don't know if you've seen those YouTube videos, and it talks about the damage that words can do yeah. for people. You know where you've got I saw one a while ago and it had an apple and it was being passed around these children mm. and they were dropping it every now and again and you know and the apple was being thrown around a bit um, and at the end the teacher said right we're going to look at what's happened to the apple on the inside and she cut it and you could see that it was bruised and dented Aww. and it was talking about you know sometimes we don't realize what the environment is doing to the inside of someone mm. and I thought wow that's quite profound I mean I know it's an apple and it was a bunch of uh, you no, know it young makes children a lot of sense. but it was quite profound and she yeah. she managed to break it down in a way um the children were sort of like, wow you know this is amazing and you don't um, know what you're doing with your words you don't you yeah. really don't yeah you know that one off the cuff comment can really cause some damage yeah and I think we need to be better we need mm. to do better mm. um but again it's a, an awareness and an understanding um, that needs to take place. Hmm. I mean, since I saw that Apple video, I think I've done it everywhere with everyone <laughs> because I, for me, I'm a visual person. So um, I can read things and hear things. Mm. Once I see it, it sinks in. Mm. <laughs> I almost need to hit all the areas mm. for it to, um, you know, be absorbed. Um, and that, that video definitely did it for me. It ticked mm. all my boxes and I, I've done it with people since mm. and it really does make sense, mm. you know. that Absolutely. It absolutely just... makes sense to... Uh, show it in a way that is um, metaphorical. Yeah. But then also, again, something that's not right on the nose. Because if you tell people, be kind, and yeah. people don't know what that means. I think no. <laughs> often we say be kind, but then not everybody understands what it is yeah. to be kind, what it yeah. means to be kind, truly. And this airplane example is a great example. Mm. Because like, yeah, it's everybody gets annoyed. There, Everybody's frustrated yeah. in that flight. And then you hear a crying baby for like 20 yeah. minutes. And then you're like, okay, my patience is finished. Yeah. But then how do you go that extra mile? Because I think mm. that's what being kind means. Yeah. You have to go that extra mm. mile to to be nice to somebody. So Maya, when we uh when you're educating people or when you're talking to people and when you're meeting parents, uh what are the common challenges you see? Like are there any common threads that are binding them all? Yes, autism or neurodivergence or having mm. a parent with elderly care needs or I think that in your I think I saw it in your brochure there's also something about Alzheimer's or yeah. other kind of like a senile um, mm. complications that happen with yeah. our parents or grandparents. Uh, so what are the common needs that you feel with these people and these families? And uh, what are you doing to support them? I also know that you're, whenever you, whenever you do an assessment, you create mm. like a 10, 15 pager of a, of a yeah. detailed document. Um, yeah. Tell us about that. How does that work yeah. and how you wish that other people would also do something like that? Yeah, so when, when a family comes to us, um, whatever service it's for, mm. um, it could be autism care or it could be with dementia or something. What mm. we do is, I mean, generally it's me. I sort mm. of go out and meet the family and find out what their needs are. And we produce, if uh, with autism, we produce an autism passport, mm. um, which is a fantastic little document that means that every member of our staff can pick that up and understand what this child is about, what their likes are, what their dislikes are what their triggers are, um, you know, what's going to calm them down. Very quickly they can understand, you know, um, and that's what our autism passport is. But we have something similar with the other services as well um, and it's just called the the client profile. And do you, you're the one who goes and does the assessment yeah. again? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, because it's not a medical assessment, mm. so otherwise it would be one of our nurses or, uh, you know, somebody else. But it's not a medical assessment. This is about understanding the needs, understanding what the the client wants from us mm. and what the family needs from us mm. so it could be that um you know in a muslim household they uh, it's it's separate the men and women are very separate they want the prayer times abided by and you know certain cultural understandings that need to take place absolutely and not all of our nurses are muslims so they wouldn't understand that but we go in and understand what this family is about what's important to them mm. um what they require in terms of support um and it's not about 
this is the medication list and this is the timing. It's looking at the family as a whole, mm. um, understanding, you know, that the dad may come home from seven and after that time he wants a quiet household. Mm. So at that time we wouldn't be sat in the front room playing board games or whatever it might be. Mm. We would accommodate mm. and understand. Which, the schedule yeah. and the timings, yeah. So that assessment is, it's really about understanding like the nitty gritty of the family. Mm. Um, and it's also about us, you know, agreeing with them what, you know about what they want to happen what they don't want to happen so that when we go in we know we know how to you know best serve their needs um and also we do like a non-disclosure agreement because families homes are private and it's Mm. your sacred space Mm. (laughs) i would not want the things that go on in my family home to be shared yes yes, (laughs) you know because it's my you know so we go in and we do this assessment i mean it's about an hour assessment but from that we get so much knowledge um and it's about not just doing the ticking box exercise. Um, it's about us offering like this whole package where we try to support the whole family mm. and not add to their schedule. Mm. Because I think sometimes when we get help in from outside, mm. it's another thing that we have to do. Mm. The women of the household, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I've got a new member of staff. I now need to train them or oh. I now need to break them in. I now yeah. need to show them yeah, the ways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we try to eliminate all of that. Mm. Um you know, so that's what that process is about. Mm. And I think that's really important. Mm. It's something in the UK, that the customer service side of care that I think we do quite well. Um, and here where care can be accessed so quickly. I mean, mm. I was looking on on an app the other day because I had a migraine and I could have had a doctor at my house in the UAE in half an hour. I mean, yes. that's phenomenal. Yeah, You'd be waiting maybe four or five days for an appointment with the GP in the UK. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> you know... Um, Although the speed and and how quick everything happens here is fantastic, yeah. If you're looking for something long term, on ongoing support, um, these this kind of layer needs to happen prior to the care, um, mm. and that's what we that's what we offer. Mm. And I'm hoping that we see more of that, mm. particularly in neurodiverse communities, because it's such a needed thing. Mm. Because the there's so many small complications that you have to explain, mm. so that's yeah. probably why. So Maya, when now that you are moving forward with your service and uh, your children are growing up, mm. uh, when you try and find parents with similar experiences as mm. yours, uh, and when you try and like look into other and a big part of your job is literally looking into other people's houses to see yeah. what's <laughs> happening there, right? Um, that's what I wanted to know. Like, what are the similarities you feel? Because I also feel like in general, parenting is a lonely job. Yeah, It's a very lonely job. You lose friends, you lose who you mm. are, you lose a lot of um, the the good about you because you're yeah. so busy trying to, you know, be off service to other people. Yeah, uh, Whether it's your marriage or whether it's your children, or mm. especially if you have children with special needs. Um, do you feel a sense of loneliness and do you feel like, um, cause I'm a psychologist, so I feel mm. like therapy is so important. Yes. It's such an important aspect. And I mm. don't think that parents or caregivers, especially, uh, mm. get that kind of support. Is that also something which you feel like you will add, um, uh, somebody who they can talk to, yeah. somebody they can l- sit and listen to. Uh, mm. it's not just somebody, Oh, I'm here to just give the medication. And I know a holistic sort of care is a huge part of what you do. Yeah. So, I mean, when the care coordinator is assigned to a family, that's their person. Mm. So, I mean, I'm, I often take phone calls from people and it's just to offload, really. It's mm. not anything that they need me to action on, and but it is just to offload. Mm. And sometimes they don't want you to do anything. It's yeah. just they, they just want, want to you share to be it. there. Yeah. yeah, they just want to share it and, and, and talk to someone that knows what it's like. Mm. Because quite often, I think for mums particularly, you share your concerns with people and if they haven't been for it, mm. it's almost like... Well, that could be ignored, or you're you're overreacting to that, yeah, yeah. which is very provocative. <laughs> to hear this. It's very hurtful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very provoking. Um, but there is a common theme in because everyone that we deal with, obviously, they're caregivers, um, knowingly or unknowingly, they're caregivers, whether it's to their mother-in-law or their child. They they're providing the care, um, and there is a underlining theme with with everyone that we meet um, that's employing us to come in and do the service that they are tired. They feel alone and isolated, um, I think, as well, because it's a huge expat community here. You don't have your family around. Quite often you don't have people from the same culture as you. Mm. Um, So it's just having that shared experience. Um, 
But I have been in to many homes and you find the mum and I recognise the look because I have it myself. <laughs> it's, you know, really, really tired. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember one lady, I was talking to her when I had my son and this is many years ago. She said to me, how are you feeling? Mm. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And she said, I hate that word, fine. Yeah. And I said, why? She yeah. said, it means, you know, frustrated, irate, neurotic and emotional. <laughs> and I thought that literally sums me up. That, that's how I Every feel. Every new mother is going through that. Yeah. yeah. And now, I mean, it's become like a bit of a term for us. You know, how was the mum? She was fine. Hmm. You know, how's she coping? She's fine. And we know, we know what that means. We know what <laughs> fine means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and there is this theme, unfortunately. And I think that having a care coordinator or having just making links in your community, these hmm. things are so important because we have to offload, particularly as women. Hmm. I mean, but I think men need to as well. Yeah, but often absolutely. When we, speak to, when we do speak to the dads or, uh, you know, the, the males in the family, it's a similar thing. It's too much. Mm. Uh, you know, they d maybe they don't have the grassroots <laughs> involvement that the, the females do, but it does seem like it's a lot for them to carry. Mm. Um, mm. And that burden of making sure that everything's in the right place, mm. um, you know. So I think people just do need to offload. <laughs> yeah, they do. Absolutely. Speaking of the weight women carry, mm. um, do you feel like or what's your take on uh, women being the default parents? For, for children yeah. in the family. Um, a lot of it is cultural, a lot of it is situational. Yes, Sometimes yeah. it's just that, oh, because the man has the job and because yeah. the woman is the one taking care of the babies when they're young, so it just mm. kind of becomes the norm, yeah. right? Um, how would you say that when it... And I, I'm not just talking about neurodivergence, mm. I'm talking about general parenting. Yeah. Um, how do you think that people can change that or improve that? Because I know that I come from a Pakistani culture. Mm. And in Pakistan, women are the default parent. Yeah. And and I also want you to maybe shed light on what you think a default parent is. Because what a default parent in my head or in my opinion is that somebody who's, uh, who's the person you ask all the questions to about the child. Yeah. That's the default parent. The, yeah. the non-default parent doesn't know where the medicine is, <laughs> what is yeah. the dosage, what's happening, who's the doctor, mm. who are they going to, what is their routines. Um, there is a lot of weight on women, especially, and I think it's it's worse today now. I think because so. because women are also expected to do other things, yeah. not just be a mom. Are you just a mom? Yeah. What do you mean? What do you do the rest of the day? So yeah. What's your take on that? So I mean, I I completely agree with you with the default parent. I think generally, it is. The mum, isn't yeah, it? It's, it's the mum. To be honest, it is. Mm. Um, I mean, in my house, it's not. I have to say, we've had a, we've That's had a lovely. little. I know, yeah, <laughs> I know. We're very, we're yeah. very forward in my house. <laughs> no, so I mean, there was a time when the children were younger, mm. and when we, we were coordinating therapists and you know everything. I, I it certainly was me. Mm. And the reason that it was me, it wasn't because I was female. It was because I was best equipped. I had the tools for mm. that job, and my husband didn't. Mm. He. He earned better than me, so mm. it made sense for him to yeah. be out earning and me to and be doing what I'm doing. And that dynamic happens with a lot of families. Yeah, 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 and that's and that's the way that it was. Yeah, um, and it would have been. It, it just wouldn't have been productive for mm. me to go out to work mm. but, because I don't earn as much as him and him to stay at home. So it was, we sort of picked what we needed to, where we needed to be based on our skill set. Mm. Um, and, and that's shifted at times. There's times when it's been better for him to be at home. Mm. You know, when I said about the boys going through puberty and, you know, yes. uh, he became the default parent then mm. because it, I didn't have the skill set for it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I tried, but yeah. I failed. <laughs> yeah, no, but in you know, puberty, boys do absolutely. become immediately more attached yeah. to their fathers. Absolutely. And, and it's shifted. It mm. was him then. I mean, now that we're setting up this business here, I'm sort of here more than I am at home. Mm. And, you know, he is that parent at the moment at home. Mm. Um, and I mean, his work schedule hasn't changed. He has to take it all on board. Mm. <laughs> but, mm. but that's the way it is right now. And I'm sure it'll switch back again. <laughs> um, but, you know, so for me, I do agree with you about generally the default parent is the mum. The mother. Mm. Um, it's not like that in my house, but I think that's just because we... Uh, I don't know if I've shouted loud or something. I don't know. <laughs> you'd have to share it. You'd, you'd have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You'd have to ask him what twisted his leg. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. So. But, but I do feel like we need more families yeah. like that who, um, and like you said, it's so important that you know what you can bring to the table the best yeah. for the children. Um but then at the same time, I feel like it's a bit unfair, mm. many, actually not a bit unfair, very unfair to women yeah. most of the time. Uh, because I think that women go through a lot of lack of support and mm. judgment 
from their friends, their yeah. peers. Again, worse it worse off when you're an autism mum. Yeah. Um, but generally, also women mm. go through so much more uh, compared to men. And I'm, and by no in by no way I'm trying to diminish what men go through. No. Uh, but I think that if you're talking about strictly about parenting, mm. the burden stays on women. Yeah, on women. Um, wrapping up, Samaya, tell me uh, what are what are your hopes for seeing services in the UAE. Mm. I know that you've talked about um, wanting to work with schools, yeah. uh, but like, what are the other things which you think that you can add to as a professional, as a mum? Mm. I know you've been connecting to a lot of parents in the community yeah, about, yeah. you know, and then they are, and you've told me such wonderful stories mm. about other parents also who have, who have benefited yeah. from your service. Um, what would you say uh, is something that's on your cards in the short term and in the long term mm. that, okay, this is, these are my immediate goals for not just the service, but how I interact with people, yeah. how I relate to people here. And then also later mm. when, when you, uh, you know, maybe let's say five year down the line. So I'm kind of technically asking a one year plan and a five year yeah. plan. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, coming here and looking for autism services, mm. um, has been sort of mind blowing because there's so much available, but it's not, in one place, it's quite hard to find the information. Mm. Um, and something that we would like to see change is mm. to have almost a hub, an autism hub, mm. where not just our service, but all services are sort of listed and registered mm. so that families could easily access information. Because I feel that it sort of depends who you know and if you fall upon the right person and the right information and at you the keep moment. Digging and searching as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my Google searches at night, it's like late night scrolling and then. <laughs> <laughs> doom scrolling uh, yeah it's it doom is. scrolling yeah the doom scrolling is yeah. you know it's real for us yeah. mums um and i would like to see you know a almost a black book of autism or neurodiversity mm. and having like a directory you know, yeah like mm. a directory having mm. everybody in one place and mm. it's a list of you know all the services available be it a sensory um equipment mm. um that you need for your home or if it's a training if it's sensory training or, or ABA training. Mm, mm. I always just like to see everyone in one place mm. um, so that families could easily navigate through that mm. because I think it's it's very time consuming trying to find the right person. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we are talking about possibly doing an app or something like that mm. um, where all services could register mm. um, and list what they do and what they offer. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I would like to see something like that happen. Mm. Um, long term goal. I don't know. I'd like to. I'm really interested in the schools and how we integrate into schools. Mm. Um not just my service, but just the understanding. Mm. Um, I was talking to someone the other day at a school and they were saying, you know, um, about children that possibly have behavioural difficulties, but not autism, but violent behavioural difficulties. Mm. Um, and in the UK, I worked in a school, it was a pupil referral unit. Mm. So it's children that have been permanently excluded from school. So okay. these children have got social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. Okay. Um, and sometimes because they are physically violent, they would need to be um, sort of guided. So you'd have to physically guide them or put them in a safe space so that they could be this way, but not harming themselves or others. Um, and I was talking to someone here and I said, do you have this kind of system here? Like what, what happens? I said, we do have children like it. Mm. And I said, okay, so do you have team teach training? Because mm. that's the training in the UK that you would have to be able to offer this sort of um, intervention. And they said, no, it's not recognised here. And I mm. said, so what training do you have for violence and, and children experiencing these difficulties? And they said, currently there's nothing. Mm. There's nothing actually, um, there's no prerequisite that you have no, to have. Nothing concrete. No. Yeah, I mean, okay. obviously everyone has the guidance and all educators in schools, mm. they have their safeguarding practices and things. But mm. they were telling me that there's nothing concrete. And I thought, wow. Mm. Um, so that's often, a huge gap you can fill. Yeah, quite mm. often neurodiverse children do need a physical prompt or... Um, not restraint, not at all. It's not about restraining, but they need to be physically prompt or Guided. helped to keep them safe. Mm. Um, and if it's not just them, um, other peers around them. Mm. Um, and that's something that I would like to sort of delve a bit further into and see, you know, how we could maybe bring something from the UK here mm. or, or have a certified um accepted level of intervention hmm. that's something or, that i really or establish a training do you yeah. also think about like training the maids like yeah. i feel like a lot of these maids are great 
Yeah. Like these helpers are amazing. They're so yeah. patient. They're so kind and they're mm. so, and they've, you know, been in the system already. Is that yeah. something that you think about? It is. And I found a lady, actually, there is somebody that said that she has had maids in and, and trained them. Mm. Um, and she was at a speech and language clinic. Mm. And she said that they come in and sort of spend half a day here and there mm. um, and to shadow the child and mm. have a better understanding yeah, of what's going on. Yeah, and it sometimes on. can work wonders. Yeah, because the maids spend a lot of time with the children. Mm. So why should they not be trained? They mm. absolutely should be. Mm. Um, you know, for me, it would be a necessity. Absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. Because anyone in those days when I was, you know, heavily involved in the education between the ages of two and seven, anybody that was around my child had to benefit them. Otherwise, they weren't allowed around my child mm. um, because they were like a sponge. Mm. And honestly, if there was a bad thing to pick up, they would pick it up. <laughs> you know, they'd hear a swear word once or a bad oh. word once and they'd pick that word up and not the others. <laughs> so we had to be really choosy with uh, what we allowed around the child. Yeah. And I think people just thought when they looked from outside, thought this woman is just so fraught and neurotic and just controlling. <laughs> um, but I think now they understand it. My friends and family now certainly understand mm. why I did what I did. Mm. <laughs> and they're quite positive about it. <laughs> but at the time, I know it looked very strange. Yeah. But yeah, so I think definitely the, any staff in the yeah. house, any training or awareness that they can have would, is going going to have, you know affect the child only in a positive way. Mm. So, and I don't think it's um, something that's a choice. I think it's kind of a necessity. Yeah. So, and I think that the maids here are so wonderful. Like they yeah. really work hard and they're with you. Like you said, they're like literally living with us. They become family members. So, yeah. And so they're like family members. They're, mm. they're literally an extension of mm. your family. So yeah, training them would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, Sumaya, thank you so much. Thank you for having for me. For your time, for your sharing your experiences. I truly wish you the best of luck. Thank and you. I wish that more parents learned from you and translated their own struggles. Like I said in the beginning to... Uh, benefit others as well because I think that th something which is very unique about um, I wouldn't say failure but frustration mm. is that if you maybe spread it around in a positive way it somehow turns into something great yeah I mean you I, you can't always say that about success because success can no. be truly <laughs> personal yeah and I think ch parents with neuro Typical children mm. will probably not relate, mm. uh, but parents with neurodiverse children can definitely understand yeah. that sometimes when we share that experience, mm. it just gives you an elevated sense of I think so. peace or maybe yeah. even something better like doing something and establishing an initiative like mm. this. And so, sometimes you just need to be told that you're doing okay. And sometimes yeah. that's enough. <laughs> yeah. And this is for all parents, by the way. Yeah. Every parent who's out there struggling, you're fine. You're doing yeah, okay. You're doing your best and that's good enough. That's good enough. That's yeah. good enough. And on that note, thank you once again, Samaya. Thank you so much. Guys, thank you so much for listening, watching, and do share, comment, subscribe. Uh, follow Samaya on her socials. Follow Home Care Dubai. Uh, mm -hmm. They're doing this wonderful thing for the community. Uh, they're established in the UK and the UAE. If you have any more questions, please let us know in the comments and Samaya will follow them. Of course. Um, thank you so much once again, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Khudafis. Don't miss an update. Hit the bell icon and click on subscribe.